Part 1 You will hear two students, Jacinta and Lewis, discussing a holiday they are planning in Queenstown, a tourist center in New Zealand popular with young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, Lewis. It's Jacinta here. Oh, hi, Jacinta. I was just going to call you. I was thinking we ought to do something about accommodation for our trip to Queenstown. Yeah, actually, that's just why I rang you. I've been looking on the internet. There was one place that looked OK called Traveller's Lodge. But when I checked availability for January, when we're planning to go, I found it was fully booked. Right. Well, we'd better do something now, I suppose. I've actually got a list up here on the computer. There's one place called Bingley's that looks possible. It's $19.75 a night. That's US dollars. They quote all the prices in US dollars. So that's about 26 or 27 New Zealand dollars. That's OK. That'll be in a dormitory, is it? Yeah, they say eight-bed dorms. And the hostel's right in the town centre. And they've got a cafe. They have theme nights every weekend, whatever that means. Oh, you know, like certain sorts of food and music. And people might wear special clothes, like that Egyptian evening we went to last year. Oh, OK. What else? They've got a sun deck area, and then all the usual things, internet access and so on. Sounds good. Was there anywhere else? Yeah, a couple more places. There's one called Chalet Lodge, which is just 18 US dollars. That's for a bed in a 12-bed dorm. They do single and family rooms as well. It looks as if it's a bit out of town. Says it's got an alpine setting. A quiet alpine setting. What do you think? Not sure. Oh, but actually, it's not far out at all. It says 10 minutes walk from town, so... Oh, and it says it's children friendly. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. What about the third place? Uh, that's called Globetrotters. Let's see. They do private rooms or five-bed dorms for eighteen fifty. It's in the centre, just by the lake, and that includes breakfast. Didn't the other two? I don't think so. They didn't mention it, so probably not. Oh, and it says something about a free skydive. Wow. Don't know if I'm all that keen on jumping out of aeroplanes. Oh, uh, Actually, what it says is you can win a chance to do a skydive. They give one away every day to one of the guests. Well, if I win it, you can do it. Anyway, do they have room? Yeah, I checked the availability. Shall I go ahead and book there then? Fine. You now have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I was looking at what there is to do too. There are lots of sites offering deals for adventure sports. <laughs> I suppose we have to do a bungee jump. Why? Well, it's Queenstown where they more or less started it as a sport. You can. 
If you really want to jump off the side of a bridge with an elastic rope tied round your ankles, I'll watch. OK, so what do you want to do? As far as adventure sports go, I was talking to someone who went whitewater rafting there. He said it was really awesome. They drive you up the Shotover River and they come down on a rubber raft through the whitewater rapids where the river's really narrow and fast and end up going through a tunnel nearly 200 metres long. I think it's quite expensive, though. Oh, I'm on for that if you are. Cool. The other thing you can do is the jet boat ride. That sounded just a lot of noise, though. It's basically just whizzing round on the river on a very fast boat, isn't it? My friend did that as well. He said it was a bit touristy, but worth it. I'll give it a go. You go right up the river canyon. He said the drivers were really skilful. But I don't mind going on my own. But there's lots to do as well as the whole commercial adventure bit. We ought to do some trekking. The scenery around there's amazing. I don't want to miss that. The place to start's Glenorchy, apparently, about 40 minutes drive. That's where lots of the wilderness trails begin. OK. I'll pack my walking boots. I'd better start getting training. I haven't done anything except sit at my desk for months. Now, is there anything else we need to decide? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a local radio program about cycling courses in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist, which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly does City Cyclists do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, we aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. At City Cyclist, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. 
That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists' Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behaviour is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorised traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need to travel safely and effectively. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organisations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organisation, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C I T I Cyclist. Co. Uk. And in order to book lessons, you can either phone us on. 020-7562-4028 or do it online. There's an application form on our website and you can just download that and send it in. We charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons plus £6 for each extra person. So you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour and for most people a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, we'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a programme just for you. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today. And he's come to share one of his pet passions with us, city traffic and our western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne, but do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth? as our politicians would have us believe. 
I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me. I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens, but still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be okay for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway. The freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost $2 billion to build, and you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your city link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past, and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly, and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog, whereas good roads increase traffic speeds, and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but for me it's clear-cut. Equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. Look at questions 25 to 30 first. As you listen to the discussion, complete the questions about public transport. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted. But by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the US metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometres away, in Detroit, only 1% of passenger travel is by public transport, whereas in Toronto it's 24%, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast 16%. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. 16% of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where third on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32%. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes. And now, 30% of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast 1% of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year, 3% of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And, of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I'd just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population, because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there's a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing. And that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car. And often, it turns out to be cheaper. 
Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal, and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 A lecturer talking about food preservation. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at the topic of food preservation and start by asking the obvious question, why do we need to preserve food? Well, apart from keeping it fresh for our daily needs, many foods, such as fruit and vegetables, are only available at certain times of the year. So if we want to be able to eat these foods all year round, we need to preserve them. We also need to preserve food for export overseas to make sure that it doesn't perish in transit. And lastly, we need to be able to preserve food for when there are food shortages. There are a number of methods of preserving food which involve both high and low temperatures, chemicals, irradiation and drying. Let's have a look at these in turn. In the 1870s, the French scientist Louis Pasteur showed that microorganisms in future of the food, a process now known as pasteurization. This involves heating milk to just 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. A new method, the ultra-high temperature, or UHT process, involves heating milk to 150 degrees Celsius for three seconds. The advantage of treating milk in this way is that it lasts much longer, though I tend to feel, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that taste is somewhat sacrificed in the UHT process. <laughs> <laughs> Tin cans were first used in the early 1800s to store and preserve food. Just as they are now, the cans were tin-plated steel containers, and the process had the advantage of being cost-effective. Unfortunately, however, there were many early cases of food poisoning, because the canning process was not fully understood at that stage. We now know the exact temperature and length of time each has greatly reduced the risk of food poisoning. People living in cold climates often preserve food by burying it in the snow and the Romans knew all about the advantages of packing food in ice. But for most people, this was not an option until the invention of the refrigerator in 1834. Today, however, refrigeration is the most important means of preserving food because the food stays fresh without needing to be treated. However, refrigeration requires an electricity supply, and unfortunately, if the power goes off, so does the food. <laughs> A variety of chemicals can be added to food, and you'll find their names listed on the labels of cans and bottles. Salt is probably the oldest of all the chemical preservatives, and was used by many ancient civilizations for many years. Sugar also acts as a preservative, and is used to preserve jams in much the same way that... Chemical preservatives are effective, but they do not suit all foods, and the processes involved are time-consuming. Another method of preserving food is by drying it. Most foods are 75% to 90% water. So if you remove the water, the microorganisms simply can't survive. 
When food is dried, it not only lasts a long time, but it also becomes much lighter, which is a big advantage, as this makes it cheap to store. Though some people argue that valuable nutrients are lost in the process. Early methods for drying food involved cutting it into strips and hanging it in the sun or over fires. But there are now a number of more modern methods which involve the use of recent technology. One of these is known as roller drying, and it's a highly effective way of making dried foods from liquids, such as soup. Have a look at this diagram to see how it works. Well, first of all, the hot soup is poured in at one end here. The liquid spreads to form a thin layer on a heated belt. The liquid dries as it moves along. By the time it reaches the end of the belt, all the water has evaporated leaving only dry powder. A blade then scrapes the dried material off the roller and captures it in powder form. All you have to do is add boiling water and you have your hot soup back again. The method is called freeze drying. And for those of you who still remain... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. No sweat. Here's a chiller way to tackle those cue cards in the IELTS speaking test. Before the test, spy on sample tests. Check out real IELTS speaking test prompts online or in study guides. This gives you a feel for the types of topics they throw your way. Brainstorm like a boss. Practice thinking up ideas for different cue card themes. This way, you won't be caught off guard on test day. Test day. Plan it out. Kinda. When you get the cue card. Jot down a few quick notes to keep yourself on track. No need to write a novel. Just bullet points to jog your memory. Ditch the cue card talk. Don't just repeat what's on the card. Use your own words to show off your fancy English vocabulary. Talk it out. Like a story. Imagine you're explaining the topic to a friend. Keep it clear. Interesting. And maybe even throw in a funny anecdote or two. If it fits. Aim for two three main points to cover everything on the card. Spice it up. Don't be afraid to show off your English skills. Use a mix of simple and complex sentences to sound natural. Don't panic on follow-ups. The examiner might ask extra questions. This is your chance to shine. Just keep talking about the topic and show you can think on your feet. Bonus tip.